they're all I'm sure very good but compared to her they just look like trash just utter trash and suddenly I was like <laughs> I was uh, it was a diving snob. I'm like, what are you guys doing here, yeah. man? There's... You guys are <laughs> awful. <laughs> yeah. This is all about you, uh, your journey in music. We'll talk about the Zolas and what you guys have going on as well. Great, man. Cool. Um, I know you're from a musical household. Uh, so first off, tell me where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in, uh, in a, a city called Vancouver, which is in Canada um not far from seattle uh and uh that's it man. Yeah, i grew up on on musqueam territory in uh uh in in canada <laughs> right on and yeah. your, your dad's a composer yeah man my dad like never really had a real job he was a playwright for a long time he wrote musicals and that was sort of how he got uh the seed money for like um having me <laughs> uh, uh yeah so like that was that was his one his one major thing he had this one hit play um which uh which was is directly resulted in me being born and then um and then after that he switched to uh to writing novels and now he writes like uh historical fiction novels uh um usually mysteries and stuff like that oh really i didn't i didn't realize that that's cool so he's not yeah, doing he's not writing musicals anymore no no he's hella jaded about the the in that industry the uh theater industry he likes to be a loner now and just like sit at home and write and he's quite prolific he's he shows more work ethic than anyone i know actually he he's he's 74 i think or mm -hmm. yeah and he still goes he still wakes up every morning at like six and writes for three hours and then has coffee and then writes until five. Wow. It's, like it's, it's and it, and he doesn't really take days off. That's just what he likes to do. He's like a real artist. Mm -hmm. I, sure. I, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't inherit any of that. <laughs> I would have been. I was going to ask you, how, did, <laughs> did that kind of rub off? Do you do a similar thing no. as far as how your writing goes? no no way i'm way more social than him so i i like to be around people and and so you can't really um set that rigid a schedule for yourself sure um, and also i just don't work as hard he's he <laughs> <laughs> i don't know uh, i guess i like other things too much i don't know sure. I, why am i not as good as my dad i don't know i don't know uh, well there's a i'm sure there's a piano in the house is that where you started very true yeah piano in the house lots of very classic uh pictures of the of the baby on a sheepskin blanket on top of the piano while somebody somebody plays and uh yeah so i was always i grew up listening to music and um through him and then he one thing that's cool about my dad is that he never got stuck in any particular era like if as far as like trivia goes, if you ask him about 60s music, he can answer anything. Mm -hmm. um, but and so that's sort of the era. That's the era where he was paying the most attention to music, but he never stopped looking for new stuff. So he he like fell in love with Arcade Fire uh, wow. when they right before they became popular. And I hadn't even really heard of them. And my dad had discovered them and was championing them. And then that's um, cool. But previous to that, I, the funniest story about my dad and, and music is um, I remember when I was like 10 or how old would I have been? Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, around 10. And uh, he picked me up from baseball practice and we were walking home together and uh, and he was quiet. And he finally he broke the silence and said, kind of looked off in the distance. He's like, very sad day today, son. And uh, I'm just like wearing my baseball outfit. I'm like, why? What do you What do you mean, is that Dad? And he's like, uh, Have you heard of a band called Nirvana? And uh, and I was like, No, <laughs> never heard of them. And he's like, Yeah, well, they're a really cool band. And I I and their their singer just uh, just killed himself. And I uh, I kind of feel like if yeah he would have been the next John Lennon if he hadn't. And uh, and I'm really sad about it. And then he he walked me home and then before getting changed he sat me down in my baseball outfit in his office and made me listen to in utero from front to back <laughs> whoa <laughs> that is rad i mean yeah. wow yeah, yeah. so he yeah. obviously yeah i mean when you say arcade fire i'm like okay he really did kind of dive into 
you know, not the mainstream as far as, although they did get that Grammy or whatever it was, like they, people were they, like, what is going on? But uh, that, I mean, in Nirvana and, and have that really kind of, you know, sell yeah. it, you know, drive home to him. Like that's pretty impressive. That's, it's, it's impressive. It's impressive. I really hope. And I, so far that is the way that I've taken after my dad is I've never gotten too, uh, too caught up in, in one, in like, just settling with what I what I love now mm -hmm. and not looking for new stuff. I, I feel like everyone should strive to keep looking for new music, even if it starts to be made by people who are way younger than you or way detached from your situation. Like you got to still um, seek out new stuff. You, you know, you had the piano in the house. Was that something you gravitated towards? Was it something that your dad wanted you to play? And was that the first instrument you learned? Yeah, I did. But then I quit pretty quick. I hated practicing. So I didn't want to do that. And my dad had a massive like existential crisis about me growing up without music. And his 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 like sort of younger, cooler friend was like, dude, relax, just just leave a, a guitar lying around the house. And then when he hits that age, he'll pick it up. So then don't worry about it. And that's exactly what happened. What What was that age? 15. 15 okay <laughs> Honestly, yeah no, it might have been 14 yeah 14 or 15 yeah so you didn't uh, you stopped playing piano and you you weren't you were just what playing sports i mean you said baseball so were you doing that up until 15 i was in sports and and theater as a kid and i sang in a choir and i was i was like a very overscheduled kid for a long okay. time and then yeah i picked up the guitar when it became important for me to um to come across as deep and soulful to um girls in high school um <laughs> and uh and yeah that was sort of that was the beginning of of starting to think about music but i honestly like didn't even consider being a musician until well past well past starting university like i, I think if you'd asked me even when i was graduating high school what i was going to do it probably would have been uh <laughs> pro pro soccer player maybe i don't know oh really so you were still yeah. really involved in sports well you were in choir and mm -hmm. you said chorus and and was it musical theater or just theater in general both yeah both. okay i was i was into all that stuff so yeah i mean but i i liked sports a lot and and i thought that maybe i could be a a, a good enough goaltender in soccer but mm -hmm. i was not i definitely could not have been so it's very good that i didn't end up doing that did you go to university for soccer no, uh, okay. I went for, I just w went to the close university at my, um, to my house. And I, uh, I went, uh, I took uh, history and English eventually. And then I got really into, uh, ultimate Frisbee and I gave up soccer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, as you do in university mm -hmm. and yeah, I got very, very serious about ultimate for a while. And then I had like Olympic dreams. I was like, okay, ultimate. I'm, it's going to be an Olympic sport while I'm still in my prime. Let's do this. And then it, it was not. Uh, it, and, but there's a chance. What I heard was the Olympic format now is the host country gets to add a sport or two, or maybe ten, five sports um, for their, when they are hosting and LA is hosting the next one. And so there's some discussion that maybe ultimate frisbee will be on that list, which would be so cool. And I, really? I, won't, I won't be there, but yeah, it, it'll, I'll be watching. It'd be so, so cool. That's cool. Yeah. I grew up skateboarding and this was the first year that skateboarding was in the Olympics. Was that exciting for you? Oh, it was so exciting. And it was crazy. Cause the guy that won like the street, which I always watched and I'm so yeah. out of touch with it. I didn't really, I recognized a couple of the guy's names, but I'm like, you know, yeah. I was skating in the nineties. Um, yeah. but the guy that won it was from Japan and he was incredible. It was crazy to watch. Why are the Japanese so good at skateboarding? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> There's so they, many good pros from, from there. Didn't they sweep like all the medals basically? Like I know the, the women were mostly Japanese who won and they're um, not, they weren't even women. They were kids. Right. Yeah. They're all <laughs> kids. They're crazy young. Um, yeah. I'm not sure in, I think. In, at least I only I didn't watch the verb because it's just not as interesting yeah. to me. Um, yeah, yeah. But the street, the the Japanese guy got gold, and then it was two American guys okay, under okay. him. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, he destroyed them. It was like unreal how good he was, and especially in the I think he got gold in both the street and the best trick, and it was just wow. What was unreal. his best trick? Do you remember? 
Um, I couldn't even tell you exactly what it was like. He did some like 360 to a grind on this. Like it was like a staircase and like a big gap and then like a rail. And he was, and he, he did like three, I think they add up your points somehow. And he like did three tricks that he landed perfectly in a row. And no, nobody else could, could even come close to doing that. Like the other, two, the other guys like landed like one or two <laughs> right, right. and he just like wow. straight up made it every time, like without even falling. It was, it, it was crazy. It's like, that's like that 14 year old diver, that girl from China. Did you see her? She, no, I watched a little bit of the diving, but I didn't see her. She's just noticeably way better than anybody else there. Like she, <laughs> she's, she's really small and she's 14, but but when she dives, like she, she lands in the water and nothing happens to the water. It's like, it's she just like cuts CGI. through it. <laughs> CGI. And, and every other girl, like I watch, I saw, I, when I started watching, I saw her diving and then she, I was like, wow, that was really, really good. But I guess they're all really good now. And then I watched the next few divers from European countries or whatever. And they're all, I'm sure very good, but compared to her, they just looked like trash just utter trash and suddenly i was like <laughs> i was a, I was a diving snob i'm like what are you guys doing here man? Yeah. <laughs> you guys are awful <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i always watch yeah. that one in the, gym, the women's gymnastics because that's such a big like thing here in in the united yeah. states especially with all the controversy that went with it and it was cool to yeah. see the girl uh the united states girl won like the all-around women's and yeah yeah and, yeah. Uh, yeah it was cool yeah, man. Simone doesn't need that hardware. She, the other girls, that they, yeah, they killed it. It's, can you imagine? Yeah, I know. I was like pretty surprised that she even came. I mean, it was cool that she came back and and did what she did the floor or something. I can't remember. She did like one event. Um, mm. but when she she bailed and they still won it, <laughs> it was like yeah, pretty incredible. Yeah, can you imagine being that, being able to do flips like that? That would just be the coolest feeling. Oh, I know. And watching it, yeah. like the when they do it on that uh the bar not yeah, the, yeah yeah not the the about the balance beam i'm like yeah yeah you i know you could seriously kill yourself like, yeah. like if you screw up like at all it's yeah nuts. i know <laughs> man oh wow well anyways i wanted to, okay so you're in chorus musical theater yeah. and then that was just what you were just thought it was a fun thing it wasn't you weren't passionate about doing that as a profession not as a profession i never even though my dad was was an artist uh by trade and uh i just never saw myself doing that i thought i'd be like a lawyer or a or a psychologist or something or or work for an ngo or i don't know what i thought i was going to do but then yeah in university a friend of mine joined a band and he suggested that i try out for that band and so i did and then they did not they did not choose me but it kind of made me want to start my own band and that really? was really started what, yeah. what did you go and what did you try to be a singer for them or what was your yeah just a singer i was just trying to be a singer and uh uh but yeah i don't need i don't even know i i don't i'd barely written any songs by that point i was a very late bloomer that way um I, yeah i really didn't think about really didn't think about being a musician until after second year of university and uh, what, did you that's when you started a band second that's when i started second. Uh, yeah, I started a band and uh, and we kept that going for quite a while and then um, and then and then started the Zolas like five years later. Oh, wow. OK, so was that Lotus Child that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you mind touching on that band at all or? Yeah, that was just like a a uh, it was a a two person band. It was like a, a very interesting I don't know. I actually don't really have a good perspective on that band because, um, because it was a really, it's a kind of band that could never have happened except for the fact that there were the two, only two people in that band have had completely, almost, almost completely opposing taste in music. So we were always trying to, we were best friends, but we liked different stuff. And so the Zolas ended up being, sorry, uh, Lotus Child ended up being like this very tiny little sliver of overlap in our Venn diagram. And, um, and so that it, it was really interesting that way. Lots of piano, uh, because that's what my friend played and his name is Tom. And, uh, and lots of, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we were really into Fiona Apple. 
and we were really into um the talking heads mm-hmm. and that was kind of that was that was kind of our main influences i think there's probably more that i'm not thinking of but yeah that that was a band that we we kind of uh started playing in small small venues in in vancouver and uh and then we got signed to a local label and that's the label that ended up um signing the zolas when i started that when we started that and you took and tom's in zolas right in the zolas he no? he was he was but he left like three years ago four years ago now okay yeah. so he he you guys started zolas together after yeah, we did. lotus yeah. child stopped yeah exactly we started a, uh, the zolas as a new band and uh and then yeah T- tom was up in the band up until this album basically so he was he was involved in the last album swooner and then this new album that we released is the first album without tom oh wow okay that's come yeah. back to life it's come back to life yeah okay so when you started the the zolas tell me about that transition was it when I mean, you start this new band did you have to like start from do you feel like you're starting from scratch I wouldn't say we were starting from scratch, uh, but we we're starting from pretty much nothing because like the Lotus Shot was only very, very regionally popular. And so um, we were just starting as a, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all from scratch. I, I always, I think everyone always kind of feels like they're starting from scratch. I feel like I'm starting from scratch now. Like every, every time we release something, I feel like it's a new, a new mountain to climb. So, um, but yeah, I think, uh, uh when that band started i don't know why it's just we had a bunch of songs that we thought were cool and we um um and i think originally the band started as just because of this label was going to pay for us to record an album and we were like we didn't necessarily think we wanted to continue with a new band but um it seemed irresistible to just like hire a couple so zolas were a result of you guys with Lotus Child ended and you guys started the Zolas, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, and then uh, that was just a, uh, that was the beginning of, of this whole thing. And that's that the Zolas started as a totally different band than we are now. It was still very piano based. Although, you know, to be honest, like I think people who, who have been with us since day one, they kind of like, there's a recognizable thing. It's kind of just always been my, songs from my perspective or at least mm-hmm. songs from like my brain and so it comes across as the same band but um but yeah we started we always were trying to write pop songs basically and it just took us a long time to figure out how to to make them actually come across as pop songs <laughs> okay that's all <laughs> and then so yeah i mean at the beginning of the of at the beginning of the of the zolas like we were genuinely just trying to write pop songs but but we didn't know how to simplify enough to make them actually come across that way mm-hmm. and um and that took a long time a lot, we weren't we were not we were not blessed with that gift right away so um now now our songs are like a lot well i don't know they're gonna get more we're kind of getting away from pop songs now to be honest but mm-hmm. Um, but for a while there, we just wanted to write like big three minute bangers that mm-hmm. would sound good on the radio. And you guys were able to, con- you know, to do that even did, on that first yeah. record. So talk to me about the, like, what was the well, first little success that you had? The first success was just on Canadian radio. Uh, we, we just started releasing songs that, that really fit them, fit what they were going for at that right now. Canadian radio is a strange zone because it's like it's its own world there's very few people a few acts who do well well on canadian radio and then and then like that bleeds down into the states or or across the atlantic or anything like if you're if you do well in canadian radio for some reason sorry if you do well in canadian radio first then for some reason it doesn't like leave canada if you succeed in the states first like if you're drake or if you're uh i don't know the weekend uh, the weekend exactly <laughs> then yeah then you'll be you'll do great in canada too but if you start in canada it's a strange little maple ceiling <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting because well, I've, I've been in or 
well, was in radio for about 16 years mm -hmm. and a band that we had on one of our shows when I was working in San Diego and played a very minimally on the air. It was a band called the Arkells. Oh, and yeah, they, yeah. I heard they're like, I was talking with somebody else quite recently. I forgot who it was, but they were talking about how the Arkells are played up there all of the time. Like they're selling out like huge arenas. Yeah, they're in a they're an arena band for real. They're they're like the uh, they're the new Tragically Hip, which was the the Canadian band from uh, that that like was just absolutely massive. Like the, I, honestly, Arkells might be the biggest. Well, I mean, I can't say that the the genres rock is such a niche genre now that mm -hmm. that to be the biggest rock band in Canada doesn't really mean that much. Um, well, it means you can play arenas and and. Uh, and buy houses and stuff, which is incredible. But it does sure. not the same as it would have been when rock was uh, was was actually mainstream. And like now, rock isn't so mainstream anymore. So right. But I just found it yeah. fascinating that they're playing arenas up there, and then they play here in San Diego. Or uh, I'm in Nashville now, but when they play yeah. San Diego, they would be like an opener on a on a show, or they'd play, you yeah. know, less than a thousand seats. Maple maple syrup ceiling, man. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's it's honestly, it feels like. I wish I knew. I'd be so cool. It'd be great if we could uh, go uh, do a three way call here with someone who works in Canadian radio because I'd be so interested to hear what they think about like why, why music that does well in Canada never translates outside. Yeah, that's so. It's so interesting. Because yeah. I mean, the Arkells are a great band, and I'm just surprised that it didn't trickle down to a bigger effect like when i was when the person told me that they were like an arena band yeah up there i was shocked like wait what <laughs> yeah, yeah. i think they just played three nights in a row at a twelve thousand capacity uh place that's insane um, i mean good great for them they're awesome band but it, to me it oh, just yeah. is so shocking because they just didn't do that here I know. I mean that it exists everywhere. Like think about like the band Kasabian from the UK. Oh, sure. I mean, they were, you know, in this in the UK at least, they were as big as I don't know, as big as anyone can be. Right. Full, uh, arena band, but or Biffy Clyro played, is similar to them. I mean, they're massive there and maybe even more so because I've yeah. barely even heard I don't think I've even heard a Biffy Clyro song. I've heard the name, but I've never heard a song. Yeah, and they're like top of like the bills and you know the bigger festivals out there too, like exactly. the headliner. <laughs> yeah. so, so it does happen, and I don't really know what the reason for that is. It's it's not. I think there's just like there's just maybe maybe there's a sound, maybe there's a Canadian sound that just uh, that radio programmers in Canada choose choose towards, and but that just doesn't translate else, elsewhere, or and the same for the UK, but I don't know, man. Uh, and, it, and it's that reason why, like, we had like a lot of a lot of um, Canadian radio success with our last album called Swooner. Mm -hmm. But then for this album, because of I sort of took a look at like where you can get when you're doing well on Canadian radio, and and I just realized that that wasn't my goal. I didn't really want to. I didn't necessarily want to be just a huge Canadian radio band because um, I was never going to be able to be as broad, um, as broadly appealing as like our Kells are to Canadians. So, so my, I just decided to stop thinking about making radio songs. So this last album that we, we put out, come back to life is just like, uh, I mean, if I was programming radio, there'd be a lot of songs on there, but uh, but for the radio that exists, uh, mm -hmm. it's not like, it's not designed for that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a different world now. I mean, you, you, you're better off being successful in streaming numbers, I would assume, than radio hits. No, not with money. Nope. No, oh, not, really? Not for money. No. Cause like if, when you get radio play, you actually make quite a bit of money, uh, on the back end. Okay. And oh, if you're getting, if you're like, a, if you get into like a current, if you're like a, you know, played 16 times a day or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So if you get if you get heavier medium rotation, rotation, yeah, and especially if you get played on satellite, I don't know where the hell that money comes from, but satellite money royalty, satellite radio royalties is like outrageously high. Um, really? Yeah, I do not know why. And you guys are on like the Verge on XM and stuff, right? 
Sure. Yeah. 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 I've I've yeah. I've heard your songs on there, and yeah. they actually play quite a bit of Canadian bands on the Verge, which is I think they're cool. based in, I think they're based completely in Canada. Oh, they are. Okay. Yeah, well, that yeah. makes sense. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm like, they're playing Tegan and Sarah. And like, yeah, I know. You guys, I'm trying to think yeah. another, uh, other, I think they play Arkells, like just bands. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. Canadian no, band. Yeah. So, like, getting like a lot of satellite radio play, like, you're not going to get rich, but you'll, it'll keep the lights on. But, um, but yeah, with streaming, no. Like, streaming, I can't, you know, we all know artists who have, millions of followers on streaming in streaming and actually like can't sell tickets and can't like they you know it it doesn't translate to actual actual hard ticket sales yeah i mean i don't even know if that's even the goal like what is the goal like if the goal is to be famous then they're very successful at that but if the goal is to at some point you do have to make a make money and like and and not just make money but make make progress and have new experiences. Like for me, like I'm, I'm most thinking about like what kind of a life I want to live. I want to live a, the kind of life where I'm trying new things all the time. Mm -hmm. And that means touring to new places. And, and then with that, that's the only, that's something that comes only with, with real success mm -hmm. and not necessarily streaming, but, but that said, like, uh, I feel like the the streaming landscape is incredibly good for music that doesn't uh, that isn't just catchy and quick to the ears like a like a, a radio song is. Mm -hmm. um, you can like put out streaming is kind of designed for vibe pieces, and right. that's great. it's great to be able to put out a vibe piece and and have that be on a playlist and get a lot of get a lot of uh, streams off that. Mm -hmm. I'm not totally sure what it means. Um, because we don't get paid for that shit. Um, but uh, I know. It's, 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 it's quite no, wild. wild no, just one Swedish guy gets paid for that shit. And, <laughs> and we, get we get to be famous. I get <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, well, it, you talked about Swooner having some radio success in Canada. Did that help as far as what we, we talk about hard tickets and, and touring? Was that mm -hmm. something that it boost, boosted for you guys? huge boost in Canada. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was, that was a big, yeah. One thing radio does is it definitely puts you into, I mean, it's kind of strange cause I don't actually know anyone who listens to the radio. Uh, I, the only time I listen to it is when I'm in a car share, like in a, um, yeah, like a Uber well, or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so it's kind of strange that radio still matters, but it does. And, and I guess, I still haven't really put my finger on it because it can't just be construction sites, <laughs> you know, it's construction sites and seven elevens or whatever else is but not even seven elevens play the radio. They're all playing playlists. Oh, interesting. And I some even, of them, some liquor stores, I guess maybe would be playing. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love radio and I, I think that radio, I mean, radio is alive and well through the, through, through the podcast medium, obviously, but, mm -hmm. um, but there's something about like, you ever listen to radio like late at night where you know that i was on the radio late at night for <laughs> a lot of years man yeah <laughs> i did night i did up until midnight yeah for a lot of years i was on from seven or six or seven o'clock in the afternoon till midnight so did that, did that give you uh, what kind of uh, station were you at were you able did that give you a bit of leeway where you allowed to play stuff that you wanted to play or or was uh, it a, uh in yeah i mean i've had i had program directors over the years that one in particular that was really cool about that like he yeah. gave me like an hour of time where i could play kind of what i wanted for you know maybe half the half the hour and we yeah. kind of split it up that way so like there'd obviously be the current records and then the yeah. then whatever like requests and stuff it was cool that is really cool. and we would do real cool stuff too like if blink played the sport the big sports arena downtown he would be he would get in you know backstage take a picture of the set list text it to me and then Whoa. i would load up the whole set list and then when people are leaving the venue, we'd play, be playing the whole show again on the air. And I'd be Whoa. calling. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then people would call. It, it, it got really cool and really engaging. You know what I mean? 
that's a really cool idea. Yeah, he was brilliant. <laughs> that's the thing that you can only do with radio where it's live, you know? Uh huh. And, that's and we were that... one of the few stations that was had a live person at night. Exactly. Exactly. I don't understand because there, there are people who would who would broadcast f- for, for basically for free. Like the radio station that we that there, we have a few local radio stations in this town, and me and another couple people who um, who are all like in well known bands, local bands. Um, we tried to get them to let us just take over the radio station on like one night a week from, I don't know, what is it? Like, it was like midnight to one or something like that and play what we wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't go for it. That's uh, crazy to me. Which seems crazy. And uh, maybe they did the math and they're like, more people will listen to the the bot or whatever we have sort of queued. Well, I mean, I don't know how ratings work in Canada, but in the states, they don't even rate those hours. They're not oh, even they're not even arbitrary. They're not even rated when in, in right. the Nielsen rating system here. So yeah. like, you get rated from like five a.m. to midnight. Those hours, right, right, right. And right. then over anything over that in those like four hour windows is just like. That's why, like, the station I worked for was was our radio, our signals in Mexico. So we had to play like the Mexican national anthem at night, and what? we had to play, yeah, like these Mexican PSAs throughout the day. Um, <laughs> but we we had to like run these big chunks of their programming, and they'd always be run in like you know two a.m. for like thirty minutes, <laughs> just because right. it it was never rated. So they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll play it, and then it'd just be in the middle of the night when there was no, it didn't matter if people were tuning out. Yeah, see, so they they had nothing to lose. I don't know. I mean, maybe I should try again. They it it seems it seems like such a fun thing to do, especially when it's not your real job, and you know, right, do right. Every day when you're just sort of moonlighting as a radio DJ, it sounds like an amazing thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun. Like yeah. you said, though, it, I mean, for what you got, the return. I mean, nowadays, I mean, earlier in my career, you could make pretty good money, and then it kind of slowly, you know, as stuff went online and advertising went down but anyway uh, yeah, that's yeah. its own beast but um <laughs> you should ask say if, and then that should be your your thing and be like dude they're not even you don't even rate these hours <laughs> like, <laughs> I wish I had first yeah yeah like, exactly. do you even get rate these i don't know what the ratings like i said maybe figure out what the rating process is there in in canada and, and use that against I'm, them i'm sure it's the same there's no way that it's like any different than it's still yeah nielsen. it's still nielsen so it's like oh it is still nielsen yeah it's probably the same exact thing and then they don't rate certain hours so there you go um well i want to talk to you about this new record so right, where were you guys at like when COVID happened were you writing this album no no we had just finished the album we were we were about to release it uh right when COVID happened um we had just finished shooting the the last video that we were gonna do um and then it was yeah, it was meant to come out in April and then COVID and then Tom Hanks went and got sick in, uh, Oh in- yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so that was, I forgot. he was like the first guy that like the first like big name person that had it. I know since I, I started saying instead of like when people, we, I think we all try to figure out how to describe this period. So people say like, since COVID, I haven't been what or whatever. And for me, it's always just been like, Man, I haven't seen you since Tom Hanks got a cough. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, we were ready to go, and then and then that that delayed things, and then um, and then I think we were going to release something else, but then there was so much um, more important stuff going on in the world that I just didn't really want to release an album, uh, not mm-hmm. just COVID, but just all sorts of political upheaval and and the black lives matter movement was finally like gaining so much exposure that to like to put out music and and try to ask for for people's ears just felt incredibly whack to me so Mm -hmm. we postponed that too um and that was fun i mean i was i was actually really glad to do that so yeah we just sort of been playing it by ear and that's the thing that you can do these days is yeah, you can sort of schedule things a year in advance, but you can also kind of be Kanye if you want to and release something uh, at spur of the moment. Right. Um, or say you're going to release something and then not release it at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, 
then yeah then so yeah instead we decided to start releasing singles all throughout the summer and fall mm -hmm. um and that led us all the way to 2021 when this album finally came out exactly a year after it was supposed to wow and yeah. was it always called come back to life yeah that's crazy yeah I, I i knew i wanted to call it come back to life before we'd even written a single song for it i don't know why you just knew that 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 had to be the record that had to be the name yeah i don't know why yeah when i first saw that i was like oh wow they must have <laughs> tied this into the whole situation that was going on and especially the tour the come back to life tour i was like oh okay this all makes sense <laughs> i know that's, it makes, that's a, the funny thing about this album everything when when i wrote these songs they all they felt like kind of niche notions that i was having uh or or sort of songs about conversations that maybe only the people closest to me were having and then and then the world changed and through covid and through uh the social justice movement and through the like increasing inability to like not notice what climate change is doing suddenly all the things that we were, i was writing about became became the only thing that people were talking about and and yeah even as far as the the name making a sense like it, it it was an album that that was it was a 2001 album written in 2019 and i don't know how that happened but um but sometimes you just like um sometimes you're you're ahead of the wave and sometimes you're behind it mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I, when I read the title and everything and I was listening to the record, I was like, Whoa, like this had to be something that you guys came up with. Over yeah. They really got things. Yeah. They started they really, like, <laughs> had good turnaround. No, no. Very slow turnaround. <laughs> oh, wow. Very slow turnaround. And you have a tour coming up right across Canada. Yeah. We have a tour across Canada. Uh, with any luck that will happen. There are some, we're, we're, we're fourth waving it out here starting to kind of like how California is, I know. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some, some question as to whether those shows will get rescheduled, but I actually don't think they will. I think they're gonna happen and it's gonna be uh, as advertised the Come Back to Life Tour. <laughs> awesome. And what, have you played yet live or is this be the first time? No, this will be the first time, but we're playing most of these songs live. Uh, yeah, uh, it's going to be, we have such a cool show. Uh, we've already planned out what the show is going to look like and and what the set list will look like and all the little details that make a show feel special and like and indelible in people's minds. And so, and I'm, we've already, we already know what that's going to be. I mean, we certainly had enough time to think about it. So, uh, so I'm just excited to, to play for people because like, as good as these songs are on record, like, and and honestly, like I've never, I've never been more arrogant about anything that I've ever done. I've actually never been arrogant at all um, about about music that we put out. I, it's always been tough. Like when you put out music, you're either gonna be a normal person where like you are, you're proud of it, but you know it never turns out to be exactly what you were going for. It it usually through the process and through working with people, it turns out every bit as good as what you were hoping for but different and um but sometimes and i'd never had this feeling before with this but with this record for example it turned out um exactly how i wanted to and it and it creates this um it creates this very kanye like uh, arrogance in you where you're just like wow i really executed exactly what i wanted to do and and then when that happens it actually doesn't even matter it doesn't even matter if people like it at all i've never felt that way i've always like put out stuff thinking that i liked it but hoping that people liked it and then this time like i i'm it's exactly what i wanted it to be and so it actually doesn't matter and for some reason that means that people like it more that's awesome i don't know why. I, I love it i love the record and i hope fingers crossed everything kind of continues where it's going as far as like your tour and you guys getting able to being able to play in oh, front man. of people here soon <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it's gonna happen. Yeah. I think it's gonna happen, and, and yeah, I mean the the, the music is uh, it's not it it's not that similar to what's what else is out there right now to me, and 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 so I feel like people who like 
who like this stuff they they kind of only they only have us to listen to <laughs> <laughs> i love it well thank you so much zach for doing this man i appreciate it my pleasure man uh, I, have, I have one more question for you before i let you go real quick uh do you have any advice for aspiring artists yeah yeah i do i only have one good piece of advice uh no, I have two. I have two. I, I used to only have one. And my own, my one used to be uh, figure out what the thing is that you do better than anyone else that you know, and that you, you have, to, and, and that you love and do that. And don't try to water it down for anyone because there's, it's so much better in today's world to be a big fish in a little pond and if your little pond is like you happen to be the best uh like psych folk hip-hop trance artist of so any you know some incredibly obscure subgenre uh in the past that would mean like okay good good news there's only two people in your whole city that likes that music <laughs> but uh in today's world the, the two people in each city is a whole lot of people and and if you're the best at that particular genre, uh, you will have a career and you will be able to play to those people. Um, so that's my that's my advice is like, don't don't try to be popular than you are. Don't try to be um, anything other than what you do best. And don't and don't lose respect for the thing that you do best, because a lot of people, they something comes naturally to them. And so they don't value it. And so they try they want to do something that that. Um, uh that's harder to them and they end up they end up sort of swimming against the current like i think you should swim with the current and the thing that you're great at you should just do that um and the other thing i think you need to do is is you can't live in a small you can't live in a in a in a small town or even a small city and and um and hope to rely on anything but luck if you want to create your own luck you got to move somewhere um where there's a lot of people and there's a lot of um, people doing what you do and people working in the industry that you like and people who have things going on outside of your city. That's the one thing that I, that I would have liked to do is not rely so much on luck. Um, and I, if I was doing it over again, I would have moved to a bigger city where my friends would be people who have more stuff going on outside of a, outside of a, a, a sort of small fishing village which is what vancouver kind of is in a way it may have a million people but at its heart it's a small town so um so yeah move somewhere good and and play only what you're good at Bring it back,